Good morning once again. Welcome back. We're going to continue with our theme of the yamas and the niyamas. And today I'm going to talk about brahmacharya, which is the fourth of the yamas. So let's sit for a bit of practice time together first. So please take a comfortable seat and acknowledge your efforts to be here. That's more than physical effort. There's a mental effort, emotional effort, a spiritual commitment. So take a seat and acknowledge that in yourself. When you take your seat, then let your breathing infuse your intention. Since you've arrived here, I'm making an assumption that you had an intention for being here. Maybe that was a very simple intention, like I have to get back to my yoga mat, or I want to be with my community. Whatever your intention for being here, let the breath infuse that into you now. noticing the pace of your breath, the flow of the breath. You could imagine it as if you were observing the flow of water and its pace through a garden hose. Is it consistent? Does the water fill out the space of the hose or does it trickle? Does the breath feel like it can fill the interior of you? And as you sense the breath infusing your intention, start noticing the pauses at the top of the inhale and the bottom of your exhale. And let's imagine that those pauses are little sort of viewing windows for us to see into our mental and physical well being. In the same way that the Chinese doctor looks at the tongue and can see certain things, we can look at the breath and the pause in the breath and understand some aspects of ourselves too. If the pause feels non-existent or rushed or forced, then you're noticing those qualities in the body and the mind also. If the breath feels simple, humble, not really activating, but sort of a natural flow in the course of things, then you might have a hunch about that in your mental and physical well-being. Noticing neither the breath nor the pause, though both are going to be there. 
begin to notice the space at the back of the throat where the breath and the pause are moving through. So for a time, that space is going to feel like the silence of the pause. And for a time, it's going to feel like the movement of the breath. But could you sense the space instead of the breath? Each rising and passing of the breath, we see that there is a rising and passing quality in life. And yet keeping your gaze centered on the space through which the breath is moving also reminds us that there is a larger presence or abiding love that is consistent in the rising and passing of daily life events. And our yoga practice, blessedly, it pierces the veil, is the phrase we use. It pierces the veil of illusory thinking. When we get caught up in the rising and passing is all there is, yoga pierces that veil and reminds us of a, a larger presence. Raise your hands to your heart. And we'll chant Asatoma Satgamaya. Om. Asatoma Satgamaya. Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya. Red Yorama Amritam Gamayo Om Asatama Sat Gamayo Tamasoma Jyotir Gamayo Red Yorama Amritam Gamayo Om Asatama Sat Gamayo Tamasoma Jyotir Gamayo Red Yorama Amritam Gamayo Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Pyon Namaha so you may bow your head to your heart release your hands and please open your eyes so brahmacharya is the fourth of the yamas and its classical translation would be a commitment to celibacy. Brahma meaning divine and charya meaning wheel or cycle. We can also translate it as having a sense of integrity in the cycle of or in the wheel of the divine. And so since most of you are urban yogis or householder yogis, you're not ascetics committing to a, 
a life of like a monk or um, a nun or a sannyasin, we could translate brahmacharya to mean we have a respectful relationship to our indwelling vitality, which includes our sensuality and our sexuality and our appetites and our moods and how we nourish this vital divine thing, this um, organism that we get to borrow. And we can also say a right relationship to the vitality, the sensuality, the sexuality, the creativity, the aliveness of others. And so making that relationship more explicit, like we're considering it, how am I respecting another person's vitality or sensuality or sexuality? How am I respecting my own? We can speak to that as brahmacharya for ourselves as sort of householder yogis or um, urban yogis, I sometimes call us that. So in this regard, checking in with yourself about when you misuse your senses, when you misuse food, when you misuse a relationship to sex or to sensuality, when are you misusing a relationship with somebody else? And to what extent do you allow them to misuse that with you? Those are bi-directional pathways. So those are some questions that we can ask ourselves. And the inquiry is a part of the process. I'm not gonna provide an answer per se, because you have to actually ask the question and live it watching in your daily life what are the small, medium, or large ways that this happens? Uh, because it will happen. That's why ancestor yogis had to write about it <laughs> to help us to be prepared that this is one thing that we wanna watch for as a yogi because diversions in our brahmacharya mean that our vitality gets depleted or our sensuality or our sexuality is misused. And that's gonna cause a kind of draft on our progress. It's gonna cause us to have some friction in the system. So to keep that friction uh, abated, we want to watch before we engage in a way that we then regret or that we have that kind of um, backdraft or friction about. So may this practice help us to sense that in real time on the map. How are you respecting your vitality right now while you're here? And pose to pose, right? Practice to practice. I saw something yesterday on social media and I could really see why parts of the tradition of yoga are distressed, <laughs> very distressed about what we're doing in sort of westernizing what yoga looks like. Now, to be clear, my um, teachers and such, they don't spend time sitting in that distress, but it's distressing for them to see it, but they don't spend time trying to solve that. They have a life of practice and stewardship and teaching back in India, but they do see this from time to time. And I can see now why they feel it's distressing that we're going off course in how we even misuse yoga here. So um, that being said, I'd like to focus into the upper back and shoulders a bit today. So if you'll have two blocks to get started, that would be helpful. And please come to table pose. It's wonderful to put padding for your knees if you need that. I have a lot of padding here where I am, so I'm not gonna shift using a blanket right now, but let's take these two blocks and place them on your mat so that they are there as for table pose. What we're gonna be doing is putting the back of the upper arm on the center of the block, about this much of the block here. When the palms are together, your arms are gonna be internally rotated. When the knuckles and the heels of the hands separate, your arms will go towards external rotation. So we're gonna start here because it's the easiest and we're looking to move to this position with the hands. So place the back of your elbows. Walk your knees back. Let the head kind of hover between your upper arms. And then press your fingers and thumbs against each other to separate the heels of your hands. Now, as the hands come behind the head here, you're not actually touching the head with the hands. That's not part of the activity. But as they come behind there, you might feel your triceps or of course the shoulder girdle, the sides of the chest. Please resist the urge to hyperextend the lower back. And let the breath come down into the pelvis and into your back waist, side waist, the back of the heart.
then roll forward on your block so that what happens next is you are, the elbows are on the center of the blocks. Go ahead and put the palms together like a prayer and bring your thighs down to the floor, press into your elbows and lift your heart. This is a really different position for your lungs and your torso and the thoracic spine and your shoulder girdle. So notice the breath here. It's sort of quality, geography, the pace. That's how you exhale. And what is the quality of tone at the end of the exhalation? What is your relationship to the movement of the breath as one source of vitality? On the incoming breath is prana or vitality. On the outgoing breath, we are cleansing. When you next exhale, press down into your forearms and your knees, raise up to table pose, and then slide your hips back again and come to the back of the elbows. Press your fingers and thumbs against each other to separate the heels of the hands. And then notice again the flow of the breath and your relationship to that as an expression of vitality. What is your relationship with the incoming and the outgoing? You might observe any places where you become more coercive or more um, distracted or where you're kind of in that hum where the focus is there and the relationship feels intimate. And then one more time, roll forward. As you come forward, you can bring the palms back to um, prayer pose. Lift up through your heart, press down with your thighs, raise the crown of your skull. Notice here your experience of the breath and also your mind. Exhale, press down with your elbows and your knees and rise up to table. Place your right hand on the block, left hand on the block. And inhale to cat pose. And let's keep the knees and hands where they are. Maybe they're a little farther than you normally have them. Exhale back to child's pose. Keep the arms straight and keep a bit of that cat pose spine in your child's pose. And then inhale, roll up to cat. Exhale to cow pose. Inhale, cat pose. Exhale, child's pose, keeping some of your cat pose spine there. And then inhale, come forward to cat pose and step your right knee and your left hand and block forward. Exhale, cow pose. Inhale to cat pose. So your body is staggered partway through the cross or the crawl part of this action. Now exhale and just go halfway back to child's pose. You will not be able to go that far. If you really keep the hips centered, you're gonna start possibly feeling into the lower back or the kidneys there. And then inhale forward to cat. Exhale cow pose. Inhale, cat pose. Exhale, part way back to child's pose. And then inhale forward to cat pose. And when you use the exhale, step backwards into cow pose. 
Inhale, cat. Child's pose. Inhale, cat pose. Step your left knee and your right hand forward. Exhale, cow pose. Inhale to cat. Exhale, part way back to child's pose. Inhale, cat pose. Cow pose. Once more through, inhale to cat, make the back of the body broad, press into both arms. Exhale, part way back to child's pose. Inhale, cat. And now exhale to cow pose as you step back with your right hand and your left knee. And then inhale, cat pose, last one. And exhale, child's pose. Keep the arms outstretched, please. And also keep the arms active. Lift the base of your skull so your head floats between your upper arms or slightly above. Walk your hands back towards your knees and please rise up to sitting, kneeling, come to Vajrasana. Okay, when you first come to Vajrasana, rest your hands in your lap and without making any particular kind of breath, focus your attention back in the space in the throat through which the breath customarily is moving. And practice sensing the space rather than the movement of the breath. Sense the space through which it's moving. The breath might be really subtle right now. Mind that cannot find its place back to that sense of space may struggle to sense the vitality of oneself or others because sensing that vitality is kind of a subtle understanding. It's a, it's a subtle sense of energy and there's an explicit sense of responsibility, but to be able to direct the mind, like feeling that space through which the breath is moving, that's one of the sort of, um, precursors to be able to sense then vitality and the relationship you have with your own and somebody else's. So I'd like us to mimic the same activity, but to mimic it from standing. So please rise up to standing. When you come up to stand, you're going to want to have a couple of blocks. I just need to move my hair off of my face. The very dry weather means that my hair is like flying away. I have I have more hair than usual. <laughs> I mean, it's like more hair like that. Okay, let's put the right foot forward and the left foot back. And I'd like you to start to the best of your ability with both legs straight. And let's put the fingertips on the block so the arms are gonna be a little bit longer, but also you're gonna have to rely a little more on your legs and your central core. And then inhale, move your heart forward to cow pose. And then press your palms down into the block and move into cat pose. Inhale, raise to your fingertips, move your heart forward to cow pose. Exhale, press your palms down and come into cat pose. Feel the strength of your arms and your legs supporting the inner belly. Inhale, raise your heart forward to cow, come up to your fingertips. Now exhale, bend your right knee, touch the left knee down. That's the beginning of Anjane Asana. 
Here's your exhale, inhale, raise up. Exhale, lower down, fingertips to the blocks. Inhale, slide the hips back and the heart forward in cow pose. Exhale to cat pose. Inhale, glide forward, rise up to your fingertips, cow pose. Exhale, Anjane Asana, bring your left knee down. Inhale, rise up. Exhale, glide the fingers down, but keep the heart lifted so you're still in a kind of cow pose here. And then inhale, glide your hips back while keeping the spine in cow pose. And exhale to cat pose. Last time, inhale, glide forward. Exhale, down. Inhale, rise up. Exhale, fingers back to the blocks, but the chest can stay open. Inhale, Parsvottanasana, using a cow pose spine. Exhale, cat pose. Pick up the right foot, step backwards, and let's do downward facing dog pose. And see if for a few moments your mind might reconnect to the space through which the breath is moving. Raise up to your tiptoes, bring your torso part way forward and step your left foot up between your blocks. Come to your fingertips. Inhale the heart forward into cow pose, which also means glide your sitting bones back. You might feel your left hamstring lighting up. And then exhale to cat pose. You can make the hands firm, arms firm. Snug the low belly in and up towards the back waist. Inhale, raise your heart forward, gaze forward. Exhale, cat pose. You are massaging the vagus nerve right now in this flexion and extension for the spine. So don't take it half-heartedly or distractedly, but with increased sincerity rather. Come into cow pose. The Sanskrit word for sincerity, by the way, is pre. It also means humility. Let's glide forward. It's one of the niyamas, and you'll be hearing about that when we get to that part of this um, immersion. Inhale, raise up. And exhale, lower your hands, but keep the chest and heart open. Inhale. Cow pose, glide your hips back, straighten your left leg. And exhale, press into cat pose in Parsvottanasana. Again, please. One of the ways that you might look at your relationship to your vitality is how you relate to yourself when you're practicing asana. What is the inner message you give yourself what are the kinds of things that you say to yourself about how you're practicing or about your capacities and your limitations? We're all gonna have both capacities and limitations. Let's go through it one more time. Inhale to rise. Now. And gliding back. Cat pose. And pick up 
your front foot and step back to downward dog pose. And listen into the body. Asteya is the practice of non-stealing. So you don't want one part of the body to be stealing something from another part, like the lumbar spine should not be exploited here due to a stiff thoracic spine. That's also a way of balancing out your vitality. The inner vital resources are shared openly and collaboratively, not with exploitation. So inhale forward to plank pose now, please. And then step over one foot to point the toes, step over the other foot to point the toes, and inhale to seal pose. Exhale, table pose. Inhale, cat pose. And exhale, child's pose. Let's bring one block back and change child's pose where you're gonna place the elbows down in front of the knees. Let's do palms face up. And let the body relax. You could imagine yourself right now as a, a lump of clay. It's not meant to be critical. Imagine yourself as a lump of clay. There's a sort of raw material that can become something. In this child's pose, we are more tamasic, so we are more like the material, but not yet the manifestation. And so you could sort of gently ask yourself if, if the potter was to consider you the clay for the, the pottery or the sculpture, like how supple, how available, how um, distracted. How much inflammation, how stressed, all of the things. Please rise up to a sitting. Now I'm saying if you were the raw materials, not yet the manifestation, if you're the materials that can become something, if you are the clay on the potter's wheel, the potter would be God or the divine or this dharma that wants to form itself through you. So how available, how stressed, how distracted, how inflamed, how um, daydreamy, you know, um, what was that? It's like the seven dwarfs, <laughs> sleepy, dopey, whatever that was from that fairy tale. Like in terms of us, how present are we? How available is this resource for what wants to be manifest? And maybe what's happening is that you're manifesting, 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 and not resting enough. So consider that too. Uh, let's come up to standing in Prasarata Parotanasana. So make your feet the length of one leg, please. Walk the blocks forward. Reach your hips back. And let the, the upper arms turn your triceps in towards your ears and your nose. So your shoulder blades are gonna be wider on your back. Now, as you press down against the two blocks, I'd like you to consider the exhale a little bit like cat pose. So feel the low belly drawing in towards the back waist. Notice how that's gonna naturally cause the upper torso to curl towards the space between the legs. It's just like a cat pose, but we're not moving the arms and legs. And then when you inhale, undulate the spine towards cow pose. Press your hands down and draw your heart forward. And then exhale, start from the pelvis in both of these experiences. So start with the tailbone towards cat pose. Inhale, glide your sitting bones back. Start to bring the heart forward. You're massaging the vagus nerve again. And as you glide the heart forward, think of the hands pressing down to pull the heart forward. Exhale, cat. Inhale, cow pose. And then last time, exhale to cat pose. Let the low belly curl in, causing the upper chest and head to follow. And last time, come into cow pose. 
Bring the heart forward, press your palms down. Notice the shoulder blades on the upper back. Let's walk the hands back and rise up to standing. And I'd like you to have a strap and a block. Okay, so if you take the strap, in this case, it's gonna go around your elbows. And one of the things about this strap is that sometimes people feel like it's gonna hit them in the face and sometimes it does. Just letting you know. So the strap is gonna go on the upper, on the um, elbows like this. And so I would recommend that you don't put the buckle on this, how shall I say this? Don't put the buckle on the upper part of the strap, put it on the lower part. This is upper, this is lower because I don't want it to hit you in the face, the buckle, right? And then take your block, put it between your hands. My strap is too big. There we go. You want the elbows and the hands to be parallel. So when you put this together, it should look like a box. Like you're seeing me through a little box. Like I'm on a little TV right there. Okay. The tail of the strap might end up in your face also. So you have a couple of uh, yoga liabilities there. All right. So with your inhale, now take the arms up over like a square. The elbows are still bent. And though the strap might touch your hairline or the top of your head, don't worry about your hair. See if you could press the block back with the elbows bent. Keep the base of the skull lifted and find your shoulder blades for your upper back. Do not push your head forward into the strap, it's not necessary. Lift the base of the skull to stabilize your neck from the front of the throat. And then you're going to exhale and release that down. Pause a moment. I, think I might be just breaching the frame of the camera when I do this. So let me show it from kneeling also, just in case it's going to be more visible to you guys, that where you're going is like this. That should look like um, if you turned me upside down, I'd be doing a forearm stand. Okay, and since when I stand like this, I think I'm just at the top of the frame. I hope you could see it better when I was kneeling. Let's do it again. Okay, stabilize your legs, steady the tailbone, bend the elbows, raise the arms up, reach the block past your head to the best of your ability. Take the elbows straight up. The strap might touch the forehead. Please don't push your head forward against it, but rather lift the base of your skull. Find your shoulder blades. So on the upper back, you hug the shoulder blades in against the rib cage. And then exhale and lower this down. This time, take the block in one hand and let the strap dangle. Close your eyes and feel what's happening now as your body kind of recirculates vitality through the neck, the shoulders, the upper back. Let's keep these doohickeys. Uh, we're going to need them again, but not promptly. We're going to go to Surya Namaskar now. Um, <clears throat> I would like to move us a little deeper into what we were just working with there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And for that bit deeper work, I'd like it to be warmer. So turn to the front of your mat, please. Bring your palms together at your heart. Bring your attention back to the space, the hollow space in the upper back of the throat, the space between the nasal passages and the interior skin of the throat. And 
Can you sense the place through which the air is moving? Stay with the space rather than being immersed in the movement of the breath. Keeping your mind there, bring in the ujjayi breath. Maintain your gaze at the place through with which the breath is passing, as if you were watching the place through which the boats are coming and going. And you kept your gaze on the portal through which they move. Inhale, hands down, widen up. Exhale, chair pose. Now rise up. Exhale, Uttanasana. Keeping your focus in the hollow of the throat. The breath is moving, the body is moving, but your mind can be still. Inhale, glide forward. Left toes back. Rise. Stand. Straighten your right leg. Pivot your left heel. Now inhale to cat pose with the spine. Exhale, rotate your torso, starting at your pelvis, then lumbar, mid-torso, upper. Inhale, rise up, Trikonasana. Hold steady with your mind in the hollow of the throat. The breath is coming and going, just like boats passing through a canal. And keep your attention on the canal itself. Exhale, return down to a kind of cat pose position. And inhale, bend your right knee, pick up the left heel. Exhale, step forward. Uttanasana. Inhale, glide forward. Exhale, right toes back. Complete the exhale and then inhale, rise up to your crescent. Now descend. Keep the mind steady in the hollow of the throat. Inhale, straighten your front leg. Now pivot the back heel. Yeah, I'd like you to inhale into a cat pose spine. My intention is to make clearance for your left hip as you exhale and now rotate your torso starting at the pelvis, then the low belly, then the mid torso, then raise your right arm. And in your triangle pose, try to keep your mind again in the same steady place. You might recall that the Brahma Vihara of equanimity is called Upekshanam. Upekshanam. Come into the tilt of the pelvis. Should be a little bit more like cat pose, a little bit less like cow pose. 
Let's check that your body is practicing asteya. No one part is stealing from another part to kind of make a pose, but rather you're in your threshold. And therefore keeping your mind in the hollow of the throat is actually more easeful. And then follow your exhale to come down. Inhale to your cat pose, spine as you bend your front knee and pick up your back heel. And then exhale, step forward. Uttanasana. Inhale, rise up. And exhale, hands to the heart. This time will include Adho Mukha Svanasana and so on. So let's raise up, Ordva Hastasana. Exhale, chair pose, Ukatasana. Keep your mind in the hollow of the throat. Inhale, Ordva Hastasana. And Uttanasana. Forward, left toes back. A little bit of a cat pose spine there. Inhale, crescent. Elbows in. Inhale, straighten your legs. Pivot your left heel. Cat pose spine. Strongly anchor your tailbone. And then exhale, open. Inhale, reach. Then exhale, left arm past your left ear. Let's touch down to the blocks and use two flat palms, please. Inhale to plank pose. Exhale, downward dog. Inhale, plank. Step over the feet to point the toes. And then inhale, seal pose. Plank. Inhale, downward dog. And left foot forward. Inhale to rise. Send. Inhale, straighten your left leg. Pivot the right heel. Keep the left hip snugged under the right hip. Inhale to cat pose. You might even feel the right lower back, just like in that asymmetrical cat cow earlier. Exhale, rotate. Inhale, reach. And exhale, right arm past your right ear. Come down to the two blocks. Inhale to plank pose. Exhale, downward dog. Inhale, plank. Step through to seal pose. And then you can inhale and do seal or Upward facing dog, whichever you prefer. Exhale, plank. Inhale, downward dog. And exhale, knees down. Please point your toes. Reach back to child's pose. And for this one, take the arms back and bow your head down.
press down against your knees and rise up to kneeling. And come to Vajrasana, rest your hands in your lap. Without monitoring the breath, without manipulating it in any way, without even doing the breath, rest your mind in the hollow of the throat. And you could ask again if you were the, the clay and the potter that is the divine, wanted to make something from you, with you, how available are you? I'd like us to take one block to lie on and then the block and the strap for the forearms again. So if you'll reach for the strap and have it where you can, you can get it from lying on your back. Don't put it on right now because it's very hard to lie backwards over a block if your elbows are in a strap. You need your hands. Put the other block where you can also reach it. So when you lie back on this block, I'd like you to lie back so that your shoulder blades are on the front edge of the block. So the base of the shoulder blades is at that first edge. Here's the first edge of the block where my fingers are showing. And that's where the base of my shoulder blade is too. So that I can bend backwards over this block. I can, because the shoulder blade isn't bending but the spine right underneath it is bending backwards like that. Yeah, and then we take the Strap and the block. Put the strap on so that it's not going to be hitting you in the face. Take the block between the hands. This time you put the strap, I should say, put it on your forearms. You're not standing up this time. So you're going to slide it back, start reaching back. You're gonna raise the hips up so that you can bend the, the um, back over the block and take the second block to the floor. Your head comes to the floor. So the hips are lifted right here. So head on the floor, the block is on the floor. Keep the elbows within the strap and hopefully your strap is again, not hitting you in the face right now. Now set up your head so that you feel like the hollow of the throat is still there. Right, it's a feeling that you can breathe through that same hollow spot. The neck is not dangling too far back and you're not clenching your jaw or holding the throat too tightly. And then begin to start lowering your hips down. And they will not make it all the way to the floor. In fact, they might not go very far at all, but I'd like you to keep some loyalty to what does the back of the throat feel like Is the neck still relaxed and your head still supported? Are you able to maintain the mental equanimity or calm, respecting both your body's limitations and its capacities? They have to go very slowly and be very thoughtful. A little change in the neck right now is an indication that you want to back off of that threshold that you're reaching towards and stay in the threshold that's actually yours. Then press into your heels, start raising your hips back up so that whatever opening you were creating by lowering the hips, you're now closing that opening on purpose. And then lift your head, 
Set the strap aside, hold the back of your head and bring your hips back down. Okay, and let's rise up to sit. And for a moment, you can just practice feeling the upper back. Like you might feel the circulation, you might feel where the block was on your upper back. Feel a little bit warm, a little bit tingly. And keep a sense of that. Please bend your right knee. Hold your right knee with your left hand. And let's just check and see if your twist has any greater mobility in your upper thoracic spine. So as you rise up, like a little bit of a back bend, and you twist to your right, you feel more supple, twisting the upper chest and the upper right quadrant to the right. Rotate back to center. Stretch your right leg out, bring your left knee up. Wrap your left hand around. Lift the upper back like a little back bend. Think about right where the block was. Can you lift the heart? And when you rotate the upper left quadrant to your left, does it feel like it has any additional suppleness? Now come around to face forward. And I think you're gonna be able to reach your other block in this manner. Keep the strap close by, lay back on the first block. Reach for your second block and put it on the flat setting under your head. Reach for your yoga strap. This time it's only for the wrists. And then reach overhead. Now your head is supported, the hips are supported. The strap on the wrists is to help you straighten the elbows, press out against the strap and enthuse the arms as uh, relevant to the pose. Don't enthuse them beyond that. And try to notice here the support you have under the head. Does the throat feel like it has enough roundness and openness? so that your mind does stay at that hollow spot and is not distracted by you compensating somewhere hither and thither in the body, which would be staya, stealing, compensating, exploiting. And that would influence your ability to be tuned in to your vitality, your brahmacharya. in a yoga pose that doesn't have any exploitation or pressure or manipulation from us and we can feel our vitality with more sincerity less friction on the line Start raising your arms up like you're sleepwalking. Put the strap aside. You're not actually sleepwalking. Curl the chin in, look forward, press down and rise up to sitting. And notice your upper back again. Let's take notice right there. Please put your blocks aside. Lie on your back with your knees really close to your chest. And let's keep the knees snugged in closely. So we're gonna come down with both knees to the left and I'd like it to feel almost like child's pose to you when your knees come down. So keep this really snug right here. 
and then raise your right arm and check and see how is it to twist in your upper back in the upper right quadrant of the torso, right shoulder, right arm. You're welcome to close your eyes. You don't need to reach the floor. I have a little obstacle here. You might just have whatever space you have, but put your mind into the interior of the throat, please. right arm back around and come onto your back like child's pose also called apanasana when you're on the back and come down to your right keeping the legs snug to the chest like you're doing child's pose raise your left arm and start to open and you might find that because the knees are so snug to the chest you would think you have less range of motion but perhaps the opening in the upper back has gifted you with some additional suppleness. In this rotation, the upper chest is relying on the whole body, but needs a special amount of support from the back of the heart. It's not asking for compensation from the left hip or the lumbar spine. So Asteya precedes Brahmacharya. left arm up and then come on to your back. And put your feet down. Okay, and let's get ready for Shavasana. So some of you know that I have a weighted blanket and conveniently it's right here. And I really like the weighted blanket on the legs in the winter, especially. So you might try something like that. <laughs> Another thing I'm very fond of for the senses, and one of the things we'd say about Brahmacharya is respecting our senses and the vitality that they help us generate. So you can also use this, it's called a Pratyahara blanket, where you put the blanket over your eyes and around your ears. And that's going to quiet the eyes and the mind, and it gives the ears a buffer as well. Let's do the palms face up. And the mind can stay in the canal of the throat right, in the hollow at the back of the throat. The breath is very simple in Shavasana. You don't have to practice anything about the breath. It's just going to breathe you. But your mind can stay there in the hollow of the throat.
all five senses, your mind and your body to deeply, deeply rest. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. entire body rest deeply giving yourself this time for your inner vitality to be restored and recalibrated the simplicity of the breath and the space in the back hollow of the throat. The space from the back of the sinuses or nasal, nasal passageways to the back of the throat.
body and the mind to rest while your inner gaze or your inner witness is present. the mind witnessing the body and the breath and even the heart or the circulation, try to sense the element of vitality or prana. Like a quiet sense of aliveness or yesterday I called it the shimmer, an inner sense of shimmering. Keeping the body at rest, simply reach up and remove the blanket from your eyes and you'll come to notice that light will return. Sense where you are. Continue to notice whatever you have a feeling of is vitality or prana. Maybe you also notice the absence of stagnation or the absence of friction somewhere. And then you can bend your knees, roll to your side. And in your own way, return to your seat for meditation. your meditation seat. Please give yourself the support that you need. The crowning jewel of your practice is your meditation time.
mind in the space through which the breath is passing, a physical space, relatively small geographical space in the body. Very little movement to the breath. If you're not looking for the breath, I'll tell you where the space is. Keep your mind in the space.
Raise your hands to your heart. Thank you very much, everyone. Namaste. We appreciate and respect and even help each other to foster that vitality and the, the experience of sensuality with life. So we are feeling ourselves as a part of the ecology, a part of nature, and also a part of one another's energetic field. May we give full respect to each other's prana or vitality and not try to extract or exploit that from someone else, nor to have ours misused. So it's reciprocal respect. Oh, thank you.